and uh, and same orders and the, the vice president said yeah same orders and he came back two times another time to say only 10 miles out or 10 minutes out I forget which uh, same orders yes now it's just five minutes out yes same orders so did I tell you different orders <laughs> five minutes later something plows into the Pentagon okay now whether it was a plane or a missile that's what happened and Mineta testified that's what happened and so that the fact that that wasn't in the 9-11 Commission report was rather odd don't you think yeah uh, who was that young man did anybody ask who that young man was so uh, there was a reading of the US Constitution uh, at Georgetown University I was one of the ones who was privileged to read a couple of the amendments and Mineta read a couple of the amendments after I did and uh, when I watched him do that I said you know maybe I ought to Right, to try to try to intercept them, and it was the same same thing, you know. Should I? Should I not? Well, Cindy Sheehan won't have any problem. What kind of whistle are you going to go? So I go down to the second floor, and here he comes out with his little escort, you know, a, a college girl. A and I said, "No, uh, Secretary Mineta, it's so good to see you." You know, he's a politician. A and I said, "I'm Ray McGovern." Oh yes, Ray. Yeah, how are you? You know, so he doesn't know me from Adam. See? So then I said, "You know, Secretary Mineta." Um, uh, some of these, you know, these, these old kinds of theories going around about what went on in the bunker there. And uh, we know your testimony. How do you explain what was going on? Who was that man that kept coming in? Did he have a uniform on? No, 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 he was a civilian. Uh, I said, well, how do you figure, you know, what, what, what happened there? He says, well, that plane in Pennsylvania, you know. The, I said, no, no, this, that, that was an hour later. The secretary. You already testified. This had to do with the one that hit the Pentagon. And so how do you, so, well, you know, that plane in, in, in Pennsylvania, we never figured, I said, no, no, it's not Pennsylvania. So either he's getting a little, I don't know, some senility in there, or maybe he's just, you know, real clever and keeping his mouth shut about that. But for eight mon minutes of, of interrogation without any waterboarding or anything like that, uh, I couldn't get anything out of him. And next thing I know, I'm landing in San Jose, California at the, Norm Mineta Airport, and so I guess if you keep your mouth shut, they'll they'll uh, name an airport well, after you. Did resign. Well, I think that uh, the 9/11 uh, Truth Movement is something to be applauded. That the reason that uh, it's so necessary is that there are so many unanswered questions, and uh, those questions are unanswered uh, because this administration won't answer them. I mean, it's that simple. Okay. Now, if they come through with, with the answers, there wouldn't be all these theories, but they don't. Okay, now, now why don't they? Well, uh, they have, have something to cover up, and the 9-11 Commission, of course, was a master cover-up. We know that. I mean, he, I can't believe Hamilton and, and Kane saying, oh, gosh, why didn't they tell us that, that George Tennant uh, sort of took Condoleezza Rice on the 10th of July and said, you got to do something about this planes, you know? Why didn't they tell us? You know, there's a lot they didn't tell us. Gosh, you know? Well, give me a break, you know? So the 9-11 Commission was a cover-up. The question is what it was covering up. The charitable explanation is gross negligence, malfeasance, misfeasance, and what, what you call it, okay? Whether it was something more sinister, you know, am I prepared to believe that Dick Cheney would be capable of knowing about this kind of attack on the Pentagon, for example, and allowing it to happen? Well, from what I know about Dick Cheney, yeah, I'd be all too ready to believe that. If he can torture people and all that kind of stuff, you know, you know if he could publicly appeal for, for the right to torture, then he's probably capable of that. But I'm a, you know, first and foremost, an intelligence professional have to stick to the evidence as it pertains here and I have to be careful not to let this kind of impression or my emotional reaction to this color my thinking on these facts and I just haven't had the time that my good friend uh, David uh, Ray Griffin has had uh, to look into this I applaud his work I think it stands up to close scrutiny I'm just not there yet because I haven't had a chance to explore the evidence myself and for many of the theories that are adduced, not, not only by David Ray Griffin, but others, sometimes there are still more questions that come up that are unanswered. And so I, I can't let myself be guilty of what I accuse others of, that is cherry picking the evidence. And so that's where I am. It's not a real comfortable position to be in. I ask people to understand that. I think in the next couple of months, I may have a chance to have some time to, to, to read, read more about it and look at some of these tapes that people have given me and I just haven't had time to look at. Well, I would say this, that there's uh, one big elephant in the living room. 
it's uh, never asked about. And people don't like to put it on any video or anything like that. But it is the relationship between the United States of America and the State of Israel. It's the fly in the ointment. It's gotten, into, uh, gotten us into a peck of trouble in the Middle East. It's got historic, historical antecedents. It's all kind of, you can, you can parse it. But this president, almost six years ago, reversed a constant policy over four decades whereby we tried to be an honest broker, where we tried to be an intermediary to try to get some rights for the Palestinians while securing the existence of Israel within secure and internationally recognized borders. He reversed that. At the very first NSC meeting, we know this because um, uh, the Secretary of the Treasury, uh, Paul O'Neill, was there and he wrote it in his book. And uh, what the President said is, the uh, first thing he said, okay, uh, we know who our friends are in the Middle East, no more of this on, our, on his broker stuff, we're going to give Ariel Sharon his head. Anybody know Ariel Sharon? And Powell raised his hand. Yeah, I, I know him. Well, we're just going to, what do you think? And Powell says, well, I think that might be dangerous to unleash the Ariel Sharon. He said, well, the president says, well, uh, sometimes a show of force it can be a good thing. You know, we'll see what happens. Well, we've seen what happened, right? Last six years, we've seen what happened. And so he reversed that policy. And the sooner we get back to a policy where we recognize that the Palestinians also have a right to exist, as, as soon as our politicians uh, can get bold enough to say, look, this is a justice issue. You can't have peace without justice. I mean, you can go back to the Bible for that because that's biblical, right? Um, peace is simply the experience of justice in biblical terms. And that's true today as it was back then. So we have to do a little bit more justice or a lot more. And uh, once we do that, once we grapple with this, uh, with this very naughty problem and uh, show that we're willing to recognize the rights of the Palestinians as well as the Israelis and not just give lip service to them, then there's some hope for a movement in the Middle East and there's some hope that we could address the other grievances that Palestinians and other Muslims and Arabs feel uh, against our policies because it's not that they hate our freedom, it's not that they hate our democracy, they hate our policies. And, you know, when Don Rumsfeld said, as he did, you know, I just you know, can't figure out these people. Why would anybody strap a plastic around his belt and blow himself up just to kill other people? You don't understand that. Well, all he needs to do, all he needs to do is look at Al Jazeera one night, okay? And what will he see? He'll see helicopter gunships. He'll see fighter bombers. He'll see tanks. He'll see bulldozers made in Peoria, all made in America, wreaking havoc on the West Bank and now again in Gaza. That's what they see. And there are 1.3 billion Muslims out there and they're not gonna let us do that much longer. And they're certainly not gonna let us prevail in Iraq. So as soon as they kind of recognize that, um, as soon as that you realize that to defeat terrorism, okay, it's, it's exactly the way you defeat malaria. Now with malaria, you follow the mosquitoes back to where they breed, right, okay? And then when you find the swamp, then you set up sharpshooters around the swamp and you try to shoot all the mosquitoes as they leave the swamp, right? Not right, not right, okay? And so it is with terrorism. You find out what swamp breeds these grievances and you don't try to shoot all the terrorists as they come out of the swamp. You drain the swamp. They drain the swamp of the leg legitimate grievances that uh, the Arabs, the Muslims, the Palestinians feel. And once that's done, and once we show some reasonable respect and, and intention to do that, then we can, and, then, and only then, will we have some real movement in the Middle East and people take us seriously that we really are a justice people. All right, thank you so much. Welcome. Awesome. That was so good.